Hi, everybody. Welcome back to uh, Metatopia and this uh, panel, which is uh, titled RPG Points of View. Uh, and uh, we have a fabulous group of guests here to start out with, and uh, one more who hopefully will be joining us over the course of the show. Um, but why don't we start with a couple of quick introductions. Nick, if you want to uh, step up. Sure. I am Nicole Lindrews. I am uh, the general manager of Green Ronin Publishing, which is uh, currently ops related so my creative stuff is more in my past i've been the general manager for 20 years and uh have done uh just about everything if you if there's a job at a tabletop game company i've probably done it for some amount of time in those 30 years that's me cool ken i'm kenneth height i'm a full-time uh role-playing game designer and writer uh, in the game space, most of my work has been either fully within or very much informed by the trad uh, group, uh, starting from, from you know, way, back way back in the day with Nephilim and, and uh, Chaos through two separate Star Trek role-playing games, and then into my Pelgrain period, Trail of Cthulhu, Knights Black Agents, Fall of Delta Green, uh, with a lot of other work for a lot of other clients and a couple of uh, more story gamey things, mostly in the pages of Phoenix Magazine, Sweden's premier role-playing game magazine. <laughs> nice. Excellent. Uh, I'm Darren Watts. Uh, I am the former uh, president and owner of uh, Hero Games, uh, the, a bastion of trad uh, you know, design, uh, but also of Indie Press Revolution. So I've kind of had a foot in, uh, in, in both camps for a while. Uh, I got out of the owning things business about 10 years ago and have uh, done freelance work ever since for Star Trek, uh, Doctor Who, uh, and I'm currently working mostly for Greater Than Games on the Sentinels of the Multiverse RPG. Also, Dendra uh, Dun Dun ah. <laughs> Metatopia is, uh, is uh, my favorite con because uh, I'm a founder of it and I also manage the panel and seminar track here. So. So uh, I, our topic of, of the evening here is uh, specifically to talk about the uh, kind of schools of RPG design. Uh, and this has, you know, come out of a, a set of discussions that we've, you know, been having in double exposure uh, for a while now uh, about like kind of like what the definitions of things like indie, story game, trad games, uh, lyric games, OSR, that sort of thing. Um, there, there's a lot of terminology that is thrown around in discussions about RPGs, and uh, we aren't necessarily the best about making sure that we're all using the same definitions when we talk about these things. Um, and that can frequently, you know, lead to confusion at best and outright, uh, you know, hostility in some cases. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> Mind confusion is what we hope for at that point. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I thought uh, with this one, we would kind of like start out just by kind of like running through uh, most of these terms uh, and kind of, you know, uh, establishing what they are. And then we can kind of move on to the discussion about uh, the current, you know, states of each of these schools and how they can interact with each other. Because one of Metatopia's kind of like founding principles is about getting different traditions of tabletop gaming to interact with each other, to learn from each other, and hopefully to kind of like synthesize into cool, new, awesome stuff. So uh, if we want to kind of, you know, start with that, I guess the oldest of these, uh, appropriately enough, is trad, is traditional uh, RPGs. So um if one of you guys wants to uh, kind of like grab hold of that, of what what you mean when you call something a trad RPG. Yeah. I mean, uh, I can do this. I can, I, well, I can jump I can in. I think everything. we can all do it. Uh, just, yeah, uh, right. I, I just, um, I, I think that uh, trad, uh, and I'm going to be arguing here, that uh, throughout, the def definitions are not about boundaries, they're about centers. Mm -hmm. So um, if you ask 100 people to name furniture, uh, most everyone will say chair. That makes chair absolutely furniture. Uh, someone somewhere might name uh, oven. Is, is an oven a furniture or an appliance? Hard to say. Could be any, could, could be all kinds of things. So boundaries are much less useful when we're talking about uh, categories, then centers are. And the center of trad is, of course, Dungeons and Dragons, the first 
role-playing game, certainly the first commercial role-playing game, and the role-playing game that virtually every RPG, uh, almost down to the present, has been designed in reaction to. Uh, even as old uh, games as RuneQuest began as, mm -hmm. well, Dungeons & Dragons is incomprehensible. I'm going to make a set of rules that would make it comprehensible. And that set of rules became uh, BRP, and when that was joined to uh, Glorantha, it became RuneQuest. Right. And so Trad uh, is games that are D&D or feel like D&D or are immediately descended from D&D or games that are intended like Dungeons & Dragons to have the set of assumptions that Dungeons & Dragons began with. Uh, world powerful GM. Every player plays one character. Uh, the object is the scene, not the narrative. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, dice, uh, hit points, things it, like it that. Character immersion is, is if not the highest, one of the highest values. Right. The, the character, right. Um, uh, that I'm not sure is necessarily defensible by the historical uh, 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 record, but sure. Um, <laughs> character, character immersion is certainly present. Um, and those sets of assumptions are the ones that when we see another game that seems to honor value or unthinkingly adopt those assumptions, we say that game must be tread. Um, and then uh, uh, trad games, because they began as D&D &D and as the immediate crowd of successors to D&D, &D, uh, maintain a sort of a dominant position in the business of gaming in terms of units sold. And so there is an assumption that any game that sells particularly well must be trad just because right. those are the only games that sell or the only games that distributors pick up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously that changes and you can... Uh, bicker and argue back and forth, and I'm sure people have about whether or not, for example, Vampire the Masquerade was trad, or whether it was uh, a story game in OVO, but uh, that is an argument for other people, and that is a boundary argument, not a center argument, and so therefore, my response is to lordly wave my hand and say, good for you, good for you. <laughs> I want to quickly take a moment to interrupt uh, this to uh, introduce our other panelist, uh, or have him introduce himself, Jim, if you want to... Uh jump in and let people know who you are can you actually hear me i can, can yes. hear you. yeah okay because I, I i i i'm i'm just two little spinning squares on my video so yes yeah, you yeah, you are that to mine as well yes okay okay i wasn't, I wasn't sure the, whether the i was which getting... people are seeing something yes so um uh i am someone whose uh experience in the role-playing industry is defined entirely by spending all of my time telling people what games are about because I'm trying to sell them games. So, uh, and uh, during my, my long career as a retailer, you know, with brick and mortar stores, and then as a convention retailer, I sold the gamut of games from, you know, the D&D &D and Pathfinder that keep your brick and mortar store open through, you know, some very esoteric <clears throat> Um, small press indie type games because I was pals with a lot of those people in that whole kind of, uh, you know, Western mass indie game design community. So I was selling, you know, like little chapbook games that people were publishing at Kinko's and stuff like that back when we, well, when we had a Kinko's next door to us. But okay. uh, so, so, so I had, a, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I've had a lot of experience with the whole. Uh, you know, kind of range of games here. And I don't know that I can necessarily speak as much to the design end of things as folks can, but I can talk about, you know, the uh, the sort of how, like how retailers think about this and how the marketplace thinks about some of these distinctions, which may be a little differently than than designers. Sure. And, you know, and, and certainly, you know, anybody who's in, you know, doing academic study on this stuff might think about it as well. So. Fabulous. Okay. Uh, so we are currently discussing the definition of trad uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, to, to other schools of design. Uh, and uh, I think we were just about to bounce that over to Nick for her opinion on this. So I, I, I'm like a contrarian spoiler for this whole panel and I love it. Fabulous. <laughs> so it... Excellent. <laughs> because, because um, I come out of, or Smogica. That was my first real game. I played a mm -hmm. couple of one-offs of D and D and knew, uh, you know, the ideas of of 
D and D as a as a game, but um, I didn't internalize them. They were not they're not the foundation for all of my gaming thoughts and desires. And when I um, started working in games, it was with uh, the Lion Rampage crew on that first edition Ars Magica, which um, is very much uh in that i i think in that trad format except for all of the ways that it's not right like right rotating story guides and shared characters and um and and uh, a game that was not um um balanced internally like the characters are not balanced internally the external meta game becomes balanced but you have to accept all of the things like multiple types of characters existing with different power levels that mm -hmm. everybody gets to rotate through and play in order to uh, make the game. I don't know what you would call an Ars Magica game coming out of that period of time when trad was all there was, or right. you know. <laughs> right. So, um, so yeah. In I, in your opinion, in that case, does Ars Magica uh, kind of like uh, represent a step towards modern story gaming that you know is perhaps not as recognized historically as it as it maybe should be? If that's uh... If I may get up on my high horse about oh, it. Yes. Sure. No, <laughs> yes. I, uh, nothing but high horses as far as the eye can see in this panel. Don't worry. It's actually one of my favorite topics um, when talking about games like this because, you know, this was 1988. Mm -hmm. um, this was, this was um, the, the things like story game and, uh, and indie and, and stuff weren't even words that we used so uh right. but but it very very much there was an absolute conceptual hard line for people when i went out into the rest of the world and said oh yeah i role play i love role playing I've, i role play three times a week i've got three different games going on and then i would talk about and then in the grogs and the sharing and the thing and the different levels and my mongoose stayed home for a season and they were just like Whoa, what are you even talking about <laughs> this is fundamentally against the concepts of role play I hate it. I can't conceive it. One character, one boss. This is my game. I make the rule. Blah 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 blah. And and like like people thought that Ars Magica was crazy pants when you actually tried to tell them how they you know how it was built. And they tried to do all sorts of things with it that fucked it up. Right. I really That's... swore I was not going to act on these. <laughs> every but, every panel that 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 we're on here uh, comes with a PG thirteen rating. Do not worry about it. Yes. Once no, once you add Nick, it's like goal. this is just going to happen. It was the... just a personal goal to not be the first one. You know? Okay, and well, all right, well then, fun language. That's well, what's going to happen. Right. PG thirteen means we get exactly one f bomb and <laughs> right. got it. We got it in <laughs> early, so, so, yeah. So, the, so yeah, exactly. So the rest but on of the other hand, now we can have as much violence as we want. So that's good. Right. Oh, well, there's going to be some coming, I think. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, guess, Jim, Jim, do you want to toss in on the, uh, you know, do you have a, a an opinion about specifically about the word trad and what it means, either what it meant at a different time and what it means today? Uh, you know, like that sort of. When so, you use the term, what are you what are you saying? When I use the term, I um, one thing that I'm usually talking about is something that is a property that is owned by a company or a corporation and not an individual. Um, so uh, like the format in general, like in retail, like we're thinking like an eight and a half by 11 book, you know, hardcover, uh, you know, 50, 60, 75 bucks, stuff like this. So, th so there's formatting stuff that kind of signals that kind of game to people. Um, Interesting. So okay. like, I, and I, I think, you know, my, I mean, you and I are, you know, uh, simpatico in some ways in that, like, I think the, like, the vast majority of what I think of as, like, my trad gaming that I've done is not d and I mean, I've played a lot of D&D, &D, um, but I kind of did, I, like, most of the d and I've played in the last two decades I've done kind of because I had to, because it's what keeps the store afloat, but was, uh, was Champions, was Hero Games. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, you know, very rules intensive. Um, it presumes that you're, you can have campaigns that go on forever. Um, uh, it's, I mean, and, and that wasn't, and, and I guess, you know, maybe Ken can speak to this, but I tend to think of just like almost all licensed games as 
sort of de facto trad based on the fact that they're that they're licensed. Um, right. And, and so you're, when, you're kind of in you're I don't want to say conflating, but you're you're kind of like connecting that to <laughs> the separate discussion of like what is and is not indie, right? Like from a from like a, a sales perspective and a you know budgetary perspective and yeah. a, and a corporate status. Perspective, and, and I, right? And, and, and I think that's one of the one of the questions I think that we that we're asking here is, you know, what what is the framework to even have the discussion in the first place? You know, when right. you say that. So, uh, so yeah. would you include in your definition in that case, like a you know small two person company doing OSR stuff? Would that be a trad to you or not? Because I mean, obviously, it's clearly not corporate. It's clearly not, uh, you know, like a big money operation. So. Um, what I would call a small two-person company doing OSR stuff is OSR. OSR. Right. <laughs> and you would keep that separate, separated <laughs> from trad as a... As a but yeah. that's orthogonal to the question of whether it's indie. Right. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Indie is sure. a whole separate thing to fight about. I mean, you know, for example, uh, Riddle of Steel, fight. which is a big, uh, uh, thick, uh, trad-looking book, but was ever only owned by one person. Right. Right, it's not a corporate ownership. I mean, I'm sure he had an LLC, mm -hmm. but that's not what we're talking about either. Obviously, um, the affect of something like that. If you have Riddle of Steel in your in your in your hands, is that in your trad hand or your indie hand? I mean, it's 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 in your indie hand in a trad format. Right. Okay. And and so I mean, way back when Ron Edwards was pioneering and promulgating the word indie. I was wondering how uh, long we would go before. Yeah. Well, we're talking about the history of, we're talking about the history of nomenclature. Right. Yeah, uh, we have absolutely. to mention like, yep. talking about the history 100%. of Romania without Ceausescu. You have to say it. Um, uh, I, I was going to interject like where the fantasy heartbreaker comes in. I mean, I'm right. ready for right. it. And, sure. and that's right. that's a that's a and it, uh, that's yet another valuable uh, question. But the Ron was attempting to play a little uh, three card Monty with definitions because when he called sure. his games indie. He meant you to associate them with indie rock and indie film. And of course, as I pointed out at the time, there is nothing more indie than Christian rock and Christian film. And they're all mm -hmm. products of singular uh, designers with a singular vision. They're never sold in uh, mass market stores. They're never played on the radio. They're as indie as anything. But that, of course, is not what he meant. What he meant was alt, right? Was right. Yes. the thing that you can buy, but you have to buy it on its own shelf. Right. And uh, the, the, the sort of, you know, Soderbergh model and Soderbergh's a great director and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But Soderbergh also has made lots of movies in partnership with enormous studios. So the Ron was trying to make a completely valuable argument that this is not rocket science. Any monkey can make a role playing game. Desktop publishing exists. Game design is not rocket science. If you can parse basic <laughs> probability and not even that sometimes, you can be a, <laughs> a, a game designer. By, and But trying to palm that card under the indie means cooler, better, alter, and Dungeons and Dragons, right. or as I pointed out, exactly. Champions, or RuneQuest, or Call of Cthulhu, none of which, or all of which, by his definition, were indie, because they were all the product of a small uh, individual designer or a couple of designers. And something like uh, Chaosium, which at that time was owned, I think, by three people, was just as indie as any other game company exactly. that he wanted to name. Right. And right. that used to make Ron very mad, uh, and, and it was always great fun to do that to him. But uh, that's why when I hear the word, the, the, the old indie word, uh, you know, I, I, have the, I haven't heard that language in a long time <laughs> yeah. uh, response. Um, yes. And, and again, it's, it, you know, uh, I was saying at the beginning that terms are defined by their center, and if by using the word indie you're meaning to signal this is a game like Burning Wheel or a game like um, uh, Shooting the Moon or a game like something done by an indie creator that we all know and love, that's great. But I think that as a, as a signal of what kind of game it is at the table, it, it, con it uh, confuses more than it explains. Right. Because it's about the economic structure of the company, which exactly. is that's literally the last thing that you should care about when you're at the table with the dice. 
right? The argument that I've been having with people over the last 20 years of owning, uh, you know, during the time that I owned Hero Games, for example, of like being left out of every kind of like indie gathering of any kind of like opportunity for uh, promotion or to work with, you know, things like the indie game explosion right here at the Double Exposure shows. Uh, Hero was somehow like not eligible for any of that. Right, because we had this very kind of like trad design and this assumption that we weren't like the rest of these games, um, despite the fact that we were, you know, like a five-person company with, you know, like complete ownership of everything that we were doing, you know, uh, uh, between us, no kind of like corporate status, and we're being outsold by quote-unquote indie companies like Fate and you know Fiasco and uh, companies that that were much larger than us, right? You know, for this. Uh, uh, in, in their operations, and yet still being kind of like left out, you know, in the in, in the cold as far as like being part of like the indie community. Uh, I remember being a guest on um, Clyde's uh, Tales from the Closet podcast uh, very early on in my in my time owning that, uh, and sitting down to have the discussion, and literally like the very first thing he said. Uh, before turning on the mic was, well, congratulations, you're my first ever non-indie guest. <laughs> Click, turned it on immediately just as I started to yell at him about that, right? <laughs> that, like, caught me in like mid-stride to like take his head off on this particular definition. It was a great tactic. I admire him as a podcaster for doing it, but I, I was like, you got me monologuing, you, you, you tricky Why fellow. You? <laughs> Why you... So yeah, so I have always tried very hard to kind of like separate that that indie is a uh, it is it has nothing to do with, with with art or design at all. That it is specifically about uh, how games are sold, how games are marketed, how games are are promoted, um, and, and and that even then, yeah, right, right up and pop right up until it was know? bought. Sorry, what? If we're going to be talking about indie and we're going to compare it to things like indie records, how many employees did Sub Pop have? Right. 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 Yeah, I don't even know. Nor does it, it matter to I the mean, music. Sure, probably, I, I probably more wonder. than two. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly more I than Chaos wonder... had. I can guarantee that. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, please. Yes. I also wonder if Ron didn't explicitly have in in his mind because this is his background, and I know this is a thing that always inflects my views on this in gaming, which is explicitly comics. And mm -hmm. the distinction between indie comics and mainstream comics and, you know, like, like um, you know, if, if you read any of Ron's writings on comics, he's like deeply obsessed with like late 60s, early 70s comics and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of um, like indie aesthetic at Marvel and, you know, high weirdness spinning off into, you know, like... Uh, art comics and stuff like this and and to some extent I think my perception about how I think of games is uh, uh, probably colored by that because I mean that was my first fandom that kind of came along with I mean I guess sort of in parallel with gaming but I, I like it's basically comics and games are the things that I've grown up with and thinking about how I you know slot them into different categories. And are probably more useful as a parallel to compare each other to than indie film or indie music. Um, Given the way they're created, I, I think that's I, the way they're created, the way they're yeah. sold, the way they're marketed. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's but, probably. But right. again, by that definition, up until TSR was sold, uh, there were no, you know, mainstream game publishers then. Right. Because the creators were still very much involved in creating them. I mean. Uh, the the uh, maybe you know once once TSR was sold to um, uh, the Dilly family, the um, the the notion is that yeah then it stops being uh, 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 indie by whatever definition you're using comics wise. But we you know until then until the the late eighties we didn't have a, a DC or a Marvel because it was all still right. independent creators uh, designing and publishing their own stuff. That right. was true. At or, the, or you know D D level, it was true all the way down to you know judges guild or whatever. Sure. Well, to to throw that back to comics in that case for it, I mean, you could pretty much argue that I mean, both DC and Marvel up until their corporate acquisitions in the late sixties, early seventies, were were remained indie in their uh, in their setups, right? I mean, yeah. you know, Martin Martin Goodman old, owned Marvel outright until what nineteen sixty eight. I mean, that's you know, yeah. it was it was a one person was, shop was, as far as that goes. But but was Goodman, um, uh, you know, a, an artist or a writer? No. Yeah. So 
going well, I think on that at all. But he was still the, making the, the making, but he was making the decisions, uh, you know, on on what did get uh, uh, right. You know how yeah. how uh, uh, things were acquired from the outside, right? For it, so yeah. he, was, so, he was the buyer. So again, I think that the parallels, uh, while maybe more exact than uh, film, are not actually super helpful, right? Uh, or they or they confuse more than they inform because comics in the 90s is different from comics now is different from comics when comics right. was a vital art form and sure. so you know once teenage mutant ninja turtles and image exist the differential that you're talking about mm -hmm. goes away because right. teenage mutant ninja turtles is outselling virtually everything back when uh, you know the early days you know little lulu was outselling everything archie still sells as many as Batman. <laughs> yes, so absolutely. when we're talking about you know, the comics market, we're already doing the same exclusion that when people talk about indie music, they exclude Christian music because they don't mean that. They right. mean REM, leaving which of course was on a major what label. Even, right, leaving aside the confusion of what even counts within comics when you're talking about, you know, Raina Telgemeier versus, you know, like whatever Marvel or DC are doing. So Yeah, and then that so, leaves uh, out sub uh, incomes um, like Vertigo or whatever. <laughs> I know right. this isn't my panel to run, but I'm just going to note Jump that in, we're please. 25 hey. minutes in and we've discussed one term. So we might want to... Well, I think we got Indian trad just kind of like right into it. We are two terms yeah. in. So, yeah. uh, so but, if we are yeah, saying we that... If we're saying in that sense that that indie then becomes, you know, certainly like problematic and difficult to uh, to to define or to use, is there another term that kind of like replaces that of any use to people having this kind of discussion, right? Is there something to that differentiates, uh, you know, like say a, a small one person company from uh, something as successful as Evil Hat or Green Ronin or, uh, you know, GTG or something like that, that then differentiates them from Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder, right? Is, is there a term to use that can kind of uh, uh, address that, on a on a on a small scale on a on a granular scale. I'm interested I mean, in Jim's take on that. Because... Yeah, since Jim is the one doing the selling, yeah. and if indie still sell moves units, then you know, go with God, Jim. Keep selling it as indie. Sell it as peanut right. butter. We don't care. We we just want to see the <laughs> sell. Move. Yeah. So I mean, I guess it. So I guess as I said before, it kind of depends on what the purpose of making these definitions is. Is it so that I have um vocabulary that customers will understand that i can break things down for them is it so that if i go to work for a company i know what it is that they're doing what their philosophy is what kind of art they're expecting me to you know to make when i go to write for them is it when i uh, you know pitch a game to somebody as a you know as a, a game organizer or gm or whatever term we're using that that they'll understand what I'm talking about. I mean, what, like, I guess maybe this is because I came in a couple minutes late, but did we establish like why we're breaking this down this way? We triumphantly did not, Jim. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of because established the confusion existed and uh, correct, we were trying yeah. to see if there was something that we could do to help sort that out. So. Uh, yeah. So, so I guess we're, I mean, um, my experience was that um, uh, particularly for new customers and young customers and customers who are um, uh, have come of age like buying on the internet, that the idea that they are buying something directly from the person that created it is mm -hmm. actually an incredibly powerful motivator. Um, okay. And, right. and, um, the thing that sells more that when I was working the, you know, IPR booth and doing my Jim likes games thing, the thing that would sell more games than anything else is if I could, you know, sincerely and without guile, have a discussion with a customer about how I knew the designer, how I had been in a play test, how we had a conversation the other day. Oh, hey, that's them over there. Wave, you know, wave to them. Uh, right. And and that was just incredibly powerful. And I think that and to the extent that there is a a sense of what indie is um, among, like I said, kind of you know the the folks that that I was always trying to um, to target who were new to gaming, to whom 
they walked up to my table and like had never played a game of D D and like were, you know, they were there at PAX and a friend dragged them into play, you know, Fiasco or Blue Rose or, you know, Knights Black Agents or whatever. And that was their first role playing game. Um, that's a whole different thing than, you know, like you go to a store and what's on offer is Dungeons and Dragons and that's where you start. And then maybe you can expand outward from there. Right. Um, but, but for those customers, the idea that they were getting something that was, you know, a kind of essentially a piece of art created by an individual or a small team of individuals, but someone that was kind of identifiable to them as a, as a person right was was what made something indie and right. as, an auteur you know, theory of game design i, 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 I was gonna say if if, it, yeah. if if it's something that you can sell as art right that you're mm-hmm. actually able to say uh you know this is from you know, the, this or this person or this small group of people who came together to create this specific thing so like chet so like i'm i'm friends with uh you know josh newman for my sins uh, so <laughs> like his most recent game is like a $65 hardcover square bound, you know, mm-hmm. crazy sort of like bronze age sword and sorcery thing that like looks like it could be a trad thing that it could be like, if it was on the shelf next to D and D or whatever, you wouldn't just at a glance know that that is not something that was, you know, slickly produced like video game licensed thing or something like that. But, um, the fact that I can that I can go, there's Josh over there, and he'll sign your book for you, makes it a different thing. You know, makes it the same thing as a staple bound zine that right. was clearly you know DIY punk rock thing that somebody did to you know do your like like you know Alice in Wonderland on LSD game or something like that. So sure. All right. So. Great. I, I agree with you. I've seen that phenomenon happen at your table and that sort of thing. I, I completely agree with that. Um, and if that is the terminology that we use for indie is that that be, that you can get that experience out of it, then I guess my question that kind of like leads to the, you know, I don't know about the necessity of this panel, but kind of like the, the, the idea behind this panel uh, is that isn't that problematic that that term has also been associated with a particular style of game design, right? That that, be, that, that being said means that if uh, I try to describe my game as indie uh, for this, because I'm right here, you can talk to me. I'm, I'm sitting next to your table. You can talk to the guy who wrote it and talk to the artist and, you know, like be part of that. But I didn't do a story game isn't that confusing to the audience, right? Like, shouldn't we have, like, some kind of, like, differential of terminology there? Sure, but it's... Th- that's where we start getting into, you know, kind of Venn diagrams here, right? Mm-hmm. And, you right. know... Um, and, like, a, you know, I would point to any of the stuff you do, Darren, as being, you know, like I said, indie game, trad styling, trad trade dress, trad, you know, what people think right. of... Um, which is to say that someone like me thinks of as trad or some, you know, any of us on this panel would think of it as trad. Um, Someone who is just walking up because they saw somebody play Monster of the Week on, you know, a Twitch stream, and that's the first time they saw someone play a tabletop RPG, they got no idea what's going on with that. I mean, it's a hell of a lot easier to sell them a $25 paperback than it is a, you know, a $70 hardcover. But beyond that, they're, you know, they're coming into it, you know, receptive to, you know, the definitions that people are presenting them with and those ideas about that stuff, you know, so. This is super interesting to me just to watch you guys and listen to you, (laughs) in part because I have been working on a little side project for a while just for fun. Uh, 2020 kind of erased all of my extra time for fun, but I still intend to launch Rabbit Run. And I have I have two projects in front of me right now for this thing that I'm just doing on my own, just for fun, just for funsies. Right. Uh, a, a, a potential literary license that would be very much um, what uh, I expect Jim would pick it up and go, this is a trad game. Um, and and a, uh, a concept game that is like 
shape-shifting animal monarchy and and uh, might actually go to using some OSR. You see me publishing OSR games? What is that? <laughs> is that does that make me indie OSR? Is am I just blowing everyone's minds? You know, right. I, I would love to see the 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 deconstruction of the company and the intent and the games that end up coming out because of the opportunities that are in front of me under the umbrella of this discussion about terminology and expectations. Sure. I, 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 I'm curious to ask you, uh, you know, as the person doing all this, uh, doing everything that you have done with Green Ronin over the last 15 or 20 years, uh, am I alone on this or do you all, I mean, you, you, you must have had a similar experience uh, of like wondering how come Green Ronin gets left out of, uh, you know, some of these discussions, right? As like a as yeah. as an indie success an indie success story, right? Uh, you know, there have been three of us, three partners split equally. We're all, and we've had, you know, we've had success and created games and licensed games. It's licensing that really put us into the man territory. Right. Sure. People. Yep. You get a license of some sort. You're, you've, you've moved up a notch and now you're the man, even if you're still doing everything at your kitchen table. And it's just exactly. Husband, right? I, I like, think Fred yeah. had the Fred had the same description and same experience with Dresden Files, right? That, yeah, that was, exactly. you know, suddenly a, a whole lot of people in the the quote unquote indie community didn't have time for him anymore because, you know, you're he's he's he's, you know. He leveled up or leveled out of you know yeah, whatever our community is, yeah. by doing this, being exactly the same person doing the exact same kind of thing that he it's had always been job. doing. It's just like a different yeah. wrap around the. I the mean, content. On, on the other hand, he's also like getting picked up by, you know, big name, you know, mainstream game distributors that exactly, probably sure. right. wouldn't have bothered giving him the shelf space before. So it's uh, absolutely, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's yeah, as he you know said. It's like I, I stopped being you know for many people I stopped being indie the day you know uh, Alliance started flooring my books, right? Like suddenly that became you know like I I you know but this people is, felt this like they the, couldn't. This is the common is sellout uh, of every right. artist ever. Well, right? exactly. Oh, you, that's why oh, you're making a living at this now. Well, you're not indie anymore. That's kind of why I'm I'm, I'm kind of interested in and curious about like other people's yeah. experience with it, right? Like it's the you know you were the, the, indie the when you were playing of... my corner dive bar, but now that right, I can go exactly. see you at the Met or whatever, no, you're not indie anymore. Right. So and once you've like made that step, can you ever, are, are you ever like welcomed back? No, no, right? no, no. Like, then you're just the failing. You right. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. I can be a failing, you know, like mainstream yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, operation. I can't ever go back to, Never if I'm back again. busking, if I'm back busking on the street corner or whatever, that's, you know, that's, that, that's not me returning to my roots. That's me, right. you know, having lost my job, you know? <laughs> yeah. I feel you on that one. We have often wondered how, how we can both be too little and, and, you know, not, not significant enough and the man at the same time. At the same it? time. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I we're about to jump as, in on this one here. as someone who has uh, been a hired gun and never run his own company, uh, mostly because I've known far too many people who've run their own companies. Um, <laughs> and then Ben was a critic uh, for 12 years and during the rise of story games. I always thought that these sorts of commercial differentiations were at most, you know, they were irrelevant to me as a designer. I mean, sure. they're relevant in the sense that I would rather write a game that sells 30,000 copies than a game that sells 300 copies. Uh, I think that's normal. And but my my design instincts by and large were trad and remain trad, and then with the rise of story games, uh, which at some point I'm sure we're going to mention, um, I discovered that a solid there, was a whole, there was a there was a different <laughs> design vocabulary involved with different assumptions. I'd played Ars Magica, I'd loved Ars Magica, but in my head, as an Ars Magica player, I was thinking this is a great new way to play D, &D to, or new way to play trad role-playing than when i first saw my life with master which i think is the game that really turned yes. the lights on in my head and mm -hmm. said oh jesus this is not the same thing right. we are not actually done with system we are not actually done with uh with with, with uh play roles and, and what the game is uh and in my life with master it was not the first game like that by any stretch of the imagination it was the first one that i played and then had all the lights go on in my head at once. And uh, that was because it was a game that was explicitly about one story. Dice were almost 
uh, tangential. They were the very best informative to play. They were far from core to play. That uh, the entire game was the product of a single design mind in a way that Mm -hmm. even Call of Cthulhu was not, even Ars Magica was not. Um, And there was a lot of things happening uh, with Paul's game, with Paul Zaga's game, that were also happening Then I played uh, like I say, Shooting the Moon or Breaking the Ice, I forget which one I played first, but one of Emily's romance games and was blown away uh, by by the level of genius uh, and elegance of that design, as well as all the other things that it was doing. And that was the thing that made me sort of take uh, Ron Edwards a little more seriously in that Sorcerer, for me, I could sort of backtrack from those games and say, I see where Sorcerer is trying to get there. But Sorcerer, to me, seemed like a a shorter more compressed trad experience than, and I know that that's not what Ron's intent was, but when I played it, that's what it felt like. And something like my life with master was, and then you can sort of, you can back read and you can say, Oh, look, Mm -hmm. these elements are happening in Ars Magica, Ars Magica, because it's breaking down the question of single GMs and single characters per player is a huge revelation. It's a huge revolution, but it's one that because I was so immersed in trad, I did not see it as that. Absolutely. And like every artistic movement, I mean, you can trace impressionism all the way back to Turner um, who died before right. the first impressionists were ever born? I was going to ask, where would you put uh, where would you put Amber Diceless then? And, and Amber scale, Diceless, right? another another game yep. that was that was almost sui generis for me, and I played that, and right. it was it was an amazing experience uh, in in a lot of ways, but it did not, for whatever reason, blow the doors off to the same the, extent. The conversation that... around around Amber Diceless wasn't oh. This opens up a whole new way of thinking about games, and we can do right. games in different ways. The it thinking was, it was well, this isn't role playing. There right. is it no was way like this. Right. This and is a weird new cult. This, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. this is we a weird new cult, form, but it's not separate from this. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it, it, it was. It was. Yeah. It, it, it was a whole different universe. But then story games, which I think is the. Uh, it, it's it's obviously still a, a fraught term because it's not like there's no story in D and D for God's sake, but. Right. Story games be, being the term that we're using that it does not refer to corporate structure is at least referring to something that happens at the table. Right. Um, then I Do think it becomes take this, this opportunity to kind of like toss out our definitions game. of that too. As long as we're as long as we're wrestling with it, do we want to? Uh, and again, my definition is games that 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 try to do or make me feel the way that uh, Breaking the Ice and uh, My Life with Master did. Games that are altering any of the core assumptions of D&D in a way to break open play style and play again to concentrate on the um uh the notion of a complete story. Narratology right. is a huge concern for those games in a way that it almost never was for D&D. Dragonlance I think was the first D&D thing that ever pretended to be concerned about what happens after this dungeon. And and right, um, right. Uh, and, and that was great, but again that was much more the well, we're telling a fantasy novel, and it was very comfortable in a way that things like, let's say, Contender uh, or Carry or um, uh, Blowback are not, are not, right? Right, okay. How about uh, either of you two, Jim, Nick? What, what do you do? How would you define uh, a story game today? What, what do you mean when you say that term? Um, I generally, I think what I mean is something where the... Um, uh, your principal concern as a player is with the overall story mm-hmm. and and not necessarily the like like you are absolutely concerned about what your individual character is doing, but like the main goal of the game is like Ken says to the kind of you know you have fealty to the narrative and not mm-hmm. to your individual you know, like tune that you've created to, to the to immersion in a single character or whatever for that. Uh, exactly. Right. Yeah. Whatever you want to call it. I got to say that. And it's funny. Ken mentioned blowback because that was one of the, like um, when I moved to Northampton to Western mass and like was immediately befriended by that whole crew um, uh, in, you know, one of whom was Elizabeth Sampet. Um, uh, uh, blowback was one of those first games that I played that did that for me. The very mm-hmm. first one I played was Mister Ub Gate, um, which is which was a you know a Wuxia game like that, and like sure. we laid a like and like we laid an actual friggin' knife in the middle of the table that we then like stabbed each other's character sheets with and stuff like that. And I was like, this is crazy, this is amazing, and it was fantastic. Um. And blowback had a similar kind of thing where it was, you know, um, where like 
you know, what are my stats? It's not, oh, they, you know, oh, I guess my stats don't really matter here. What matters here is, you know, paranoia and, you know, like all of us, like dancing around each other as these burn spies and stuff like that. Um, and it was really fascinating. Um, like the first hint I got of that in a trad game, honestly, was from uh, was from Feng Shui, mm-hmm. which was yeah. like the first trad game I played where like like you could like and and you know thinking back on it now many years later, you could see Robin kind of like pointing in that direction and going, "How can I push this format?" You know, while still remaining constrained by it to to let people do stuff and you know. Like the idea that you you couldn't build a character from scratch was like a bananas thing at the time. That it was like, no, you have to work concerned with archetypes and tell them specific kinds of stories. So you're just gonna be one of these things. You fill in a few things and boom, we're going in this, you know, this crazy action movie is the thing that's gonna be important to us. And that right. was kind of the Genre first has requirements and yeah, that was kind of the right. first taste, the first taste of it that I got. But yeah, really, you know, falling in with that Northampton crowd with you know, Elizabeth and Josh Newman I'm, and I'm Rob Bull and that one because I was certainly on my list. All the bakers and, you know, like, yep. you know, like I played Apocalypse World with Meg running it and Vincent playing in it. Like, you know, out of the, you know, like the first time I played Apocalypse World was with them when it was just playbooks, right? Before they had right. even yep. published the book. And sure. so, you know, I was very very fortunate and privileged to be kind of in the ground floors a lot of that stuff was or at least you know a, a particular version of that stuff because they were all feeding each other and challenging each other and building off of each other as that was being developed so i you know i have pretty specific thoughts about what all that means to me because i was in for some of that getting you know developed i was lucky to be there um are you guys familiar with camden Wright's um Oh, um, one child's heart is that one it? child's heart? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So is that uh, is that where you're going with your story game? Is that like where these story games are ending up? Is is uh, that kind of we are we are literally facilitating a moment essentially? Yeah, I mean, you I know, that's, that's a direction to take it. Absolutely. Yeah, yes. that's, I don't that's, know if it's any direction, but it is a direction. Yes. It's I'm just wondering if, when we're talking story games, to use to use uh, Ken's, are we is is that um, on the edge or is that in the core, um, or or isn't is it neither? I I am not set to judge that, but I mean uh, my and I haven't played uh, Cam's game, which I've heard nothing but good things about, uh, so I can't really directly say. But my impression is. Because it's about, as you say, looking at this one character and this one moment almost, that it's sort of on the bubble between story games and lyric games. Yeah. Uh, Ooh, the next thing we're going to do. Well, the segue, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, <laughs> right on panels. Um, yeah, and <laughs> I can I can speak to this because the actual coiner of the term lyric games, John Harness, is in my Fall of Delta Green game. And I've been buddies with him for a couple of years now. And he meant it uh, in parallel with lyric poetry versus epic poetry. And that mm-hmm. epic poetry is about a narrative, right? The Iliad, mm-hmm. uh, Paradise Lost, whatever, right? It's a story. It, it's, a, it's a narrative. Whereas a lyric poem is about how you feel when you look at daffodils, right? Or, right. Right. Uh, or just a moment of recognizing true love, like uh, Keats's Ode to a Grecian Urn is a lyric poem. And so lyric games are about creating a moment or an emotional uh, uh, sort of a, a presence in a way that even story games, although story games obviously are about emotional uh, import and theme and, and lots of other things like that, uh, that lyric games are designed to create that or to facilitate that in a way that even story games are not necessarily. Pricing it about narrative. Story. Yeah, exactly. prizing that that moment, that sensation. Uh-huh. And so right. I think, and again, uh, someone else who's played the game should probably run, run in and correct me, is that One Child's Heart is about a narrative that leads to a lyric moment, almost, in yes. a way. I, I backed it, I've read it, I haven't played anything this year, so um, yeah. I, sure. I, right. I just have that very surface level. And it, and it also strikes me that it, it's but... sort of hardcore material, and so maybe... You know, we have to wait until we have a little more of our emotional armor back on before we can play it. Right. 
I'm not um, gonna lie. I looked yeah. at it was like this is not the game for my twenty twenty. Not the twenty twenty game. That's just and, me. And, and so, legit. no, absolutely fair. And so the I love the the instant that John made it. Um, I I fell in love with it. I think it's it's you know almost the only actually useful term we have because it does come from grown up people literary criticism. Um, and 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 I very much love that. But also, of course, then you can go back and you say, well, isn't Call of Cthulhu in some ways really structured? in that same way that One Child's Heart is, that it's a narrative that leads to this emotional moment, the climax right. of you find the monster, you go insane, you're probably eaten, but it's about <laughs> expressing that inchoate panic in a way uh -huh. that it's not actually about expressing a mathematical result or, gosh, I hope my parapsychologist levels up. Uh, right. it's, yeah. it's actually about that lyric moment, that emotional that that encounter point. with the numinous or whatever right. of uh, and right. you can, and you that, can that is that. clearly the point. I mean, uh, the first lyric game that I ever saw or was exposed to is the moon game, right. right? Is the idea that like every time you look at the moon, you are collecting that experience, right? That you collect mm -hmm. times that you look at the moon, and at the, when you see the moon, you then kind of like make a note to of of everything else that you are experiencing at that time, and then add it to your collection of all of the times that you've looked at the moon right kind of thing and that was just such a that that same kind of concept of like it's it's the moment that you're trying to capture and you want to get every kind of like detail every you know like look at it from every perspective this kind of like frozen moment in time and i think that cthulhu when it's done right uh absolutely can be about that can be can be centered on that and, and cthulhu of course was was uh very uh it, I don't want to say unique, but it was it stood out in the '80s as a game that was attempting to model a story type, uh, the, the Lovecraftian investigation story, in a way that you know Dungeons and Dragons was not trying to model Beowulf. Dungeons and Dragons was trying to explain why you kept fighting things, um, and <laughs> Call of Cthulhu was much more trying to be it's Charles Dexter Ward, but you live, uh, hopefully, and then go on to the next right. one, uh, and and so you can see, like I was saying, precursors and seeds. So in a way, you can say Call of Cthulhu is the first story game as well. But but again, people well, were and, playing I mean, D and D ad story games in 1974. So I'm not vampire sure. with their storyteller, like they, they right, labeled yeah. the guy. Or I'm sorry, not guy. That's not generic anymore. But I'm a child of the 70s. <laughs> God damn it. Um, but a person, a leader, sure. um, mm -hmm. right? It, it was yeah. the storyteller. It was about your story. That was and, and with all the material that's in, that's intended to, uh, to reinforce theme and, inter and and feeling at the table, you can say that it's also in the same way that Call of Cthulhu is sort of straining towards that lyric moment that it's looking but for. It was, you know, designed in 1990. So right, it, and and relentlessly trad in in a lot of its mechanics. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And and so, I mean, the, the, the end, uh, not to be totalizing, but the end result is your game at your table and you can play the tradiest of trad games in a lyric moment and have a transcendent moment and you can play lyric games uh, too defensively and wind up having a very unsuccessful trad game with it. There's no, <laughs> th there's nothing the designer can do to make you play correctly. Sure, of uh, course. Correctly. Right. And of then course. so it's, it's up to you at your table to do things. And all these are, they're not even as, as useful as ingredients on the side of the, of the soup packet. Um, because, you know, well, it's carrots. I hate carrots. You might not hate carrots. These are different carrots. These are story carrots. You may love these carrots. <laughs> and, and so it's very much, it, it's sort of just a little nudge or, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a, in most cases, most people playing this game get story, and that's why it's My Life with Master. Most piece, people playing most of these games, in most cases, get an emotional lyric moment, and that's why it's the games from Sad Mech Jam. Most right. of the people playing these games, most of the time, kill orcs and take their belongings. That's why it's trad. That's why it's D&D. &D. Sure. We don't. I don't think anybody is trying to be prescriptive in any way. With I think these. a lot of people are Michael. trying to be prescriptive well, all the damn time. And sure, I think that is that is we, nugatory. We at having best this discussion effort. are not uh, are, are no, not doing we're, that. We're right. panelists. We're we're right. far exactly. above all that. Exactly. Minutes. So I'm coming in. Do are we going to take any questions or are we just going to talk? Because I'm go good either way. Let Let's shoot over to our uh, to our bird in our ear uh, uh, voice to find to out find if out we if have we have any questions that they think uh, we absolutely need to wrestle with with before, before this, this is, over. is 
The room is empty after, after us. That is, that is certainly true. true yes. Uh-huh. So, so we're we're, we're not, we're not going, going for hours, but we can go. You know, an hour twenty or whatever if we want to. If if, if, people, if people feel like, like we need to yell about OSR for ten minutes. Right. Yeah, we haven't even done that yet. But so. I, th- I think there is, there are probably several, depending on what your goals are for this. The one that uh, sparked this discussion in a previous panel was specifically the discussion of level of immersion, of, of, the, of priority of immersion, right? That the, the objection that a number of players coming from tra- traditions had to the story game concept was that it bothered them, it made them feel uncomfortable to be taken out of their character and asked to make decisions about things that their character couldn't know, couldn't have any impact on for the purposes of making a better story, right? And so we weren't trying in that discussion to be, uh, you know, to have a judgment on that, but simply to, like, put games on a spectrum of games that you know, prize that level of immersion and kind of like support it to games that 100% assume that you are kind of like watching all of this happen from above the table and have, you know, control over the universe and some responsibility to the narrative quality of the story. So that's one uh, kind of like spectrum that you can place games along, once again, without making any kind of judgment about them, just to say, what what is it mechanically that they're supporting? Do we have others you can think of, other spectrums that are that are worth... Uh, uh, labeling something on. I mean, I think Jim is not wrong to say that commercially there's a sense yeah. that there's a spectrum between something made by a multi multinational corporation that's offered on the New York Stock Exchange and something that's stapled right. together by a guy in a basement in Framingham, Massachusetts. Yeah. And you could have sure. that as a spectrum, certainly. And again, because it is, as I've said repeatedly, orthogonal to design. It actually makes more sense to do as an XY or XYZ as an XY sort of yeah. access concept than as mm-hmm. a be end all and be all. But I, I, I absolutely, you know, I would never question Jim's uh, knowledge of, of what the market actually likes. And, you know, the, the, the fact that you can't point uh, to Pathfinder and say, you know, um, uh, Lisa Stevens made this and you can point to, um, uh, 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 Golden Age champions and say Darren Watts made this is a difference, right? It, it, it's it's right. a thing, and so, but I don't think that it talks uh, talks valuably about design so much as it talks about you know the the, the way the game is uh, is approached from outside. Sure, and it does to some extent talk about what your expect. So from a customer standpoint, it does talk to some extent about what your expectation, what your investment is. If I mm-hmm. want to play, if I want to play Star Trek Adventures, and I want to go all in on it, it's three hundred dollars, right? If I want to play Apocalypse World and I want to go all in on it, it's twenty eight dollars. Um, you know, and if I want to play Golden Age Champions and go all in on it, it's what forty bucks, something like that. But if I want to play Champions and go mm-hmm. all in on Champions, that's a vast, vast stable of, you know, like the, the essentially endless, sure. you know, investment that <laughs> I could, that oh, I could yeah. make it's, in that. So, you know, it's like, too grand it's, if you want to yeah. go all in, but that's not, yeah. you know, I, I don't know anybody who's done that, but that's, you know, if well, you know them, please send them our way. You, you, you know, very, you know, very well people who've done that, uh, Darren. I, I, I do actually. That's <laughs> true. I, I, yes, that's true. But I, but I think the majority of people who've who played champions or GURPS or, or any game like that are playing core book and a couple of supplements. Um, that, right. right, the Mutants the, of Mastermind, same thing. Right, three yeah. editions yeah. and seventeen years of uh, books that have piled up. That's uh, right. that's a. And in, in theory, you could you could go you yeah, could go right, hog right. on on Mutants and Masterminds, or you could just get the Mutants and Masterminds core book and have a great game right out of that with with nothing. So it's it's sort right. of a how what do you mean when you say all in player? Would you, to, I mean Dungeons and Dragons? You legitimately need all three core books, right? I mean that's that's an expectation that's that's reasonable. 
uh, for RuneQuest, it's less reasonable to insist you have to buy everything from RuneQuest. You just buy RuneQuest book, 13th right. Age, same thing, right? Right. Well, and if if you are in the mood to do an awful lot of the creation work on yourself, then All In on Hero is 1999 for Sidekick, right? I mean, that's all you need to actually yes. right. uh, build your own game if you are the kind of hobbyist who feels like bu- building their own game. So, well, and I think to so 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 then that points to some extent to um, are we providing toolkits for story, or mm-hmm. or are we giving people the option to you know if, if you, you want. want everything, everything like, like all, all of the kind of kind of back-end, back-end creative, creative work done done for you, for you we, can we can do that, do that. you know you know if you, if you want, want an, like 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 if, if i never, never wanted, wanted to ever write, ever write my own adventure, adventure but but play, play a game a game, a game, a game a week for the rest, for the rest of, my of my life i could, I could get dungeon, dungeon crawl classics and and do that right right sure so but but if i want to like i said but you know i like i keep going back to this world because i think it's a you know, whatever, you know, whatever it's a property that, that a lot of people that, people that even weren't necessarily, necessarily familiar with, uh, you know, intimately, intimately familiar with story games, I kind of understand that a lot of other stuff mm-hmm. from that. But but if I want to play a game of a week, a game a week of Apocalypse World for the rest of my life, um, I'm writing every single one of those scenarios and doing all that. You know, I'm 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 essentially becoming you know to some extent a like after the fact co designer of the game, right? right. Um, and and that's a thing that you know, uh, trad games you can play them that way, and plenty of people do. But I think I I think it's useful to think of one of the st- distinctions being that you know trad like I think of trad as if you don't want to play that way, a trad game gives you the option to you know play using stuff that has been generated for you in advance for as long as you need to and as much of that as you might need. Right. You know, like at least I said, like on the retail kind of commercial side, that 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 was a useful distinction for me to have when I was selling games to people, and they were unsure about how much work they wanted, you know, how much homework between games they wanted to do. To right, you know, exactly, to how much time I got to sit around and and come up with fronts and do whatever. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, right. So we want we to want to talk about. about oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Absolutely. And and ev- part of why we have this discussion is because so many people have self-identified and don't necessarily mean the same thing, right? This is part kind of like why we're, you know, uh, uh, taking the time to kind of like hash out. And once again, I don't think we're solving anything here, but we are kind mm-hmm. of like describing the ways that people generate confusion by doing that, right? By using a term uh, that does not match what the person they're talking to thinks of that term meaning, right? So Hold on, we're not solving this? Sorry. What kind of game well, panel yeah, is it? You know, yeah. Right, exactly. Come on. Yeah. Nicole has explained. It's over. <laughs> it's done. I've explained nothing. Do it this way. I mean, yeah, I mean, self-identification. We'll be sending you, yeah, we'll, we'll is, be sending you the, 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 the pamphlet that we generate out of this panel yeah. and just distributing <laughs> it to everyone so that yes. they know how to use these terms from now on. And then enforcing it on pain of death. Mm. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, self <laughs> It, a lot of it depends on uh, on what your goals are. If it's just a game you're making for your group or you're just going to show off at conventions, call it whatever you want. Mm-hmm. If you have to get Jim to sell it to somebody, then you can self-identify as, as trad or indie or OSR or whatever as loudly as you want. But if you're making something that goes against uh, the market's expectations for those terms, you are going to run into friction of your own creation. Um, and uh, poor, poor Darren wanting to be indie boots, <laughs> boots him nothing because indie right. consumers are not interested in champions. Uh, they're, you know, perhaps being a little closed minded, but that's just the way the world is. And <laughs> so Darren is uh, constrained to some degree to uh, uh, pay attention to incorrect use of the language in order to communicate with his would be customers. Right. right. I'm not. Is characterizing that, I don't think. No, not at all. And and le- even less so, I mean, customers, yes, but also uh, like my commercial uh, uh, prospects, right? Like whether mm-hmm. or not uh, my company was allowed into an indie promotion uh, was a matter of some considerable debate that wound up costing me money, right? I mean, it's a, you know, yeah. uh, as a company, so. 
And and I'm again, I'm not going to say you you know you shouldn't have made that effort because obviously you're the best judge of of what you should or shouldn't do. But right. I don't think you went in there not thinking that there would be a fight. Right. Right. right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sure. So so you made uh, you made an <laughs> eyes open decision. You knew intention. that the difference oh, absolutely between, right. between your self assessment yeah. and the world's assessment was going to create that friction ahead of time. And that's really all you can do is just sure. know that if you think of yourself as a I don't know, just to pick something random, a timeless genius whose work should be hailed forever, and other people think of you <laughs> as just that guy who goes on too much about Cthulhu, and lean into one brand or the other, but don't be surprised if right, yeah. you get paid like B, not like A. <laughs> <laughs> now, should that's we, some life advice that I could be I can be behind. Should right? should we talk about OSR just so the people who watch this on YouTube and exactly a year why don't we get yeah, something? Let's... Throw that one out there for uh, the, kind of like the last term in our in our title that we did not, in fact, actually hit mm -hmm. yet. So, jump on in, Ken. Um, yeah, I mean, OSR stands for Old School Renaissance, or it used to stand for. I don't know what it stands for now, but that's what it used to stand for, and that was a creation mechanically in good Marxist fashion of a means of production be uh, being opened up to the people. Uh, the uh, uh, open gaming license, uh, which we have neither the time nor the interest in getting into. Uh, meant mm -hmm. that uh, 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 Wizard of the Coast would no longer aggressively pursue uh, people who uh, did clone versions of old Dungeons & Dragons products. And OSR uh, began as a way to go back to the zeroth or uh, at at, early, at latest advanced Dungeons & Dragons rule sets and create compatible products for them. It started out with a lot of adventures and dungeons and then uh, back sort of into clone games that were one or another version of the Holmes set or basic or uh, expanded D&D uh, &D, and uh, have then spawned their own uh, little ecosystem of games. And this can be, uh, you talked about Dungeon Crawl Classics, Darren, which is almost indistinguishable Jim. from, uh, Jim. or Jim rather, I'm sorry, uh, almost indistinguishable from, you know, the old uh, TSR grind them out adventures in exactly the same style with exactly the, in some cases, exactly the same aesthetic. Do things that are exactly intentionally, yeah. uh, intentionally attempting to create other sorts of play experiences, but using those rules. And I'm thinking, for example, of uh, the Black Hack, which uh, was a way to hack the old school D and D, and then turn it into the basis for Call of Cthulhu style adventures. And so, lots of people have been doing lots of different things uh, with that original sort of Igax Arneson Holmes Moldvay rule set, uh, and uh, use it for one or another purpose. Uh, and create the ethos. And a lot of OSR creators were, like the early uh, story game creators, were very sort of loud and edgelordy about it. And um, <laughs> uh, so the trouble with, uh, I, th I think there was a period when a lot of story game creators were sort of under the Ron Edwards umbrella, whether they wanted to be or not. I think a lot of OSR creators are under some of those early creators' umbrella, whether they want to be or not. And you can... Um, uh, lean into that or not for marketing purposes, but as a design question, OSR means this is basically uh, a and d or an earlier edition of d d as our core rule set, and then what we're doing with it depends on the aesthetic of the designer. Does that seem... Sure. Yeah. Uh, either Jim, Nick, have something to add to that? I have one thing to add to it, but why don't we... Uh... Check you guys first. I, I think of it very explicitly as uh, nostalgia for a thing you never experienced. Is, yes. Is a lot of what drives OSR is like a lot of people that like, you know, they're, you know, they hear stories about what it was like in the old days. They're reading like, you know, biographies of Gygax and Arneson and, you know, and and finding, you know, like public dom maybe not public domain, but, you know, like copies of the old rules and stuff like that. And and like Ken says, this would be so awesome if we could, you know, um, uh, have this, but by way of Swedish death metal, you know, and then right. you end up with, <laughs> with Morkborg, right? Uh, and right. so that, and, and I, but I, I very much think that that like, like, we're going to create something that is ostensibly new that we want to recapture our idea of what this thing used to be, uh, you know, right. and there's plenty of that going on in music and film and all that kind of stuff and right. everything. And this is just the, the iteration of it happening in, in gaming. And, and absolutely this is the, like the, the whole publishing revolution 
because it's super easy to do this stuff now. And, you know, you know, you do a five grand Kickstarter and you're, you know, you're golden for, for publishing stuff like this. I, I know, have always explained yeah. the, the aesthetic of OSR as being the equivalent of garage rock, right? Like we're specifically going back to the, to the way that like something was done earlier and embracing the fact that it was imperfect at the time. Right. And embracing the fact that it was messy and required a lot of, you know, like the player and GM involvement to fill in the cracks on the things that we forgot to actually put in the rule book. Right, this is the fuzz uh, and, and like distortion. embracing that, that the fuzz and distortion is the part that we're there for, is that we're like excited about and want to actually interact with again. Like you said, whether or not they were actually present at the time or not. Right. I mean, I was, mm -hmm. you know, eight when that was happening. I don't have a great, uh, you know, like awareness of what the, the the culture was part of because it was basically right. an older cousin introducing it to me. But I certainly understand the appeal of, you know, like a band today trying to get together to, you know, sound like, uh, you know, the Ramones or whatever, right? It's yeah, a, it's and I'm, cool I'm, I'm like equal parts like fascinated and amused and baffled by it because I, you know, we played D and D like I, you know, I'm going back to the. <laughs> you know my my blue box home set was the first tv mm -hmm. that i played and i do not i mean there's a nostalgia in that like that was how i discovered gaming but i do not have any nostalgia for that rule set or like <laughs> the the yeah. experience of uh, you know stumbling through it trying to figure out what the hell i was doing <laughs> yeah. um and so to to see people like creating these games that are trying to evoke the sense of that. But when I look at them, I'm like, this makes a hell of a lot more sense. And it's a lot cleaner <laughs> and very <laughs> clearly has been yep. ported through 40 years of game design yeah. right? to try and, well, you know, to create this thing that ostensibly is this old thing, but really it's, it's, the, you know, it's, 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 it's own the new, new thing. The amount of science and the amount of engineering you need to do today to get your speaker to sound like they, just sounded <laughs> off the shelf in 1965. Right, yeah. Exactly. Right? I mean, that's, you know, yeah. so. And, and again, I'm not sure there was a lot of Mc Victorian mudlarks that would be super into steampunk now either. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's right. the same sort of, you know, we, we, we had to suffer for this. Why are you doing it for fun <laughs> attitude? I, my take on OSR is that I'm really glad that it's had time to develop because my first impression was it was kind of an angry, uh, revolt that reminded me a lot of um, the guys who were mad that I was getting into gaming when I was a teenager mm -hmm. or when I was right. first getting into the industry as a young woman in the industry and these these slightly older men who were like what are you even doing here um, sure. I think that that is like a, um, a definitely my own baggage like my own filter on that oh no not at all but, I think that's a that that's a early, legit way to look at it yeah that early OSR stuff really kind of put me off I was like uh, you guys are like going a little hardcore on the this is how it used to be and that's why you're you know you can never be strong or or whatever the argument mm -hmm. was right, um, right. And, and I'm, a, the, I've been really, really glad that, that it has like um, moved on from that. And, and like, some of it has. I wouldn't even, you know, well, like go I mean, so far a, as say it's been eliminated. But, there's a real yeah. vibe similarity. But, but there are similarity. places where there's not, so, which, is, right, which yeah. I never expected, I guess, to develop out of yeah. that um, place where it seemed to have started. And sure. There's a vibe similarity between it and uh, Civil War reenactors. It's like, right. yeah. I think kind of. by, by, by and large, the vast majority of people who are Civil War and actors just like sleeping outdoors and talking about Antietam, right? I right. think that's right. what they sure. like. Yeah. And w one or two percent are maybe really mad that Bobby Lee lost. <laughs> and so I think that within the OSR, there may be one or two percent who are really mad <laughs> that Nicole got to write games still. I yeah. think most of them just like sleeping outdoors and talking about Thacko. Right. But sleeping right. outdoors in a design sense. And, and you would hope that there is at least, you know, right. like a percentage that is aware of that and like feels bad and is trying to do something of, about the fact that Nicole felt unwelcome, you know, like I mean, in this I situation. mean, you look at someone like, like Paul Baldassi, uh, yeah. who's, doing, who's doing some of the best OSR work in terms of design, you know, someone like Paul is legitimately just a guy who loves the hell out of the Battle of Antietam. Absolutely, That's yes. really sure. what he wants. <laughs> right. And if right. Nicole wants to talk to him about the Battle of Antietam, he'd, he'd be over the moon. Because look at that, right. a new right. person I can talk about Antietam to. And I think that's what most OSR <laughs> people are. And even, I think, a lot of the edgelordiest ones were just feeling not so much a rejection of Nicole, but they were feeling like, 
you're rejecting the Moldvay Holmes wisdom by chasing after these new experiences, but these old experiences, right. you've forgotten what they were like. You're cartooning them. You're defaming them in some cases. If you're a, a, a super indie preacher and saying this is the better way to role play than D and D or whatever. Yep, yep. Um, right. Oh, I, I, believe me, I'm still stinging from the fact that I caused the industry brain damage by helping to bring up Va Vampire the Masquerade. Well, yeah, if, is, if, right. if, if a burden you that know, I carry. the amount of the amount of uh, of of uh, of brain damage that I've caused has still not been measured, Nicole. We're <laughs> not even into my contributions to that uh, with Vampire. Like, like I Fifth. literally, I was not, I was not joking <laughs> that I, um, that I would consider some OSR beginnings uh, for for things to play with in my side company because it's yeah. actually moved enough away. So sure, I'm, I'm glad about and, and it. Because, I'm happy and because right. the core experience. I mean, we all we all laugh and, and point, but uh, Blue Box D and D was a great little engine for what it was. And right. uh, people like James Malashevsky and Greg Nardia did a lot of very valuable anthropology, basically say, how was it played? What was that like? What did it feel like? And, you know, just like some of the reenactors, yeah, they get in their, you know, Chevy Suburban and they drive back home, but others of them, they freaking March. They want to know what it was like. And that's, right. and that's an impulse that I find and very interesting. And as a, exactly. sort of a, a, a critic or a scholar or a historian or whatever you want to call it of the industry, or the art form, I think that's valuable. And I think that the OSR also produces a lot of just really gonzo manic creation in the way that Fun stuff, absolutely. Any, right. Anything where you turn it over to an individual creator and a and a Photoshop program is gonna is gonna wind up with. I think that I, by empowering solo creators to work with a rule system that they didn't have to think up, you've freed a lot of people who actually, you know, they're they they aren't very good rules makers, but they're really good. Um banana thing come up with hers right, right. and so <laughs> i, 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 I like will that. always i will always have something to say i will always be you know like interested in the conversation with people who think the first three kinks albums are the greatest thing ever created right i mean it, it's still that same you know they're better than the first three stones Once, and Bundles albums i don't know if they're the yes best they are 100 percent. <laughs> sure but no and i'm not necessarily making that agreement but what i'm saying is i definitely can talk to that guy who believes that right like I'd, right. I, i'm interested in that conversation all right, Andy, we got anything left that uh, needs uh, shaping up before we move on here? Yeah, uh, people are asking what a good term is that merges trad and story games, uh, something that's both focused and crunchy. Some people in chat have suggested neo-trad or indie trad for that. Sure. Um, I used the... I used the... Oh, go ahead, Ken. I mean, I'd want to know what game they're talking about before I came up with a term and then asked them to fill it. Uh, burning Wheel, Gumshoe, Free Spacer. Okay, all right. Gumshoe, gum, Gumshoe's a system. It's not a game. So, f sorry. First, first, what I would say is that Gumshoe yeah. is a system, <laughs> and it's right. not a game. Knights Black right. Agents is a game. Gumshoe is a system. Um, right. I right. use I use the phrase trad adjacent uh, for that yeah. kind of stuff. Sure. Um. Be, like I said, and in and in particular for stuff like like Knights Black Agents, Ashen Stars, stuff like that, that is, um, uh, um, you know, if Knights Black Agents came out as a like a, a a you know like a six by nine paperback at two you know whatever like two hundred fifty six pages or something like that, bam, it would just go right in there next to Fiasco and Monster of the Week and all that kind of stuff and everything. It Pelgrain prefers that you know, hard, that kind of hardback D and D format for their books. So their stuff all looks very, um, trad and, you know, and kind of the rule sets are, there's like, a, a you know, significant overhead with the rule sets and stuff like this and everything, kind of a lot of the ideas and the way that you think of the narrative there is, you know, has a lot of indie influence. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I like that, um, uh, uh, trad adjacent is 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 the phrase that I've been using. People have come up with like awkward portmanteaus, like tradindi <laughs> and stuff no, like that, and everything. No. And I, 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 I really don't. I really don't like that. Um, uh, you know, but but that's that's the phrase that I use. I don't know that it's. I think once you get to that point, then actually having a discussion, you know, that that is a little bit of a back and forth about triangulating you know on that xy axis right. on, on, those, on that axis exactly yeah that, that that that's where that becomes 
right. that becomes useful because I don't I don't know how much a you know a single all inclusive term to talk about that interstitial space necessarily is new but. new trad games new games that come out that uh you know are not uh you know new versions of old games for it uh that you know are 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 not some OSR variation on something um there's very few that don't have at least a sizable chunk of story in their DNA now right it's a yeah. pure trad as a design space uh has been so thoroughly kind of like infiltrated by a lot of story game ideas that you know new games that have in many cases very kind of like trad looks to them uh whether it's you know all of the various uh, uh Pelgrane titles or whether it's uh you know uh Sentinels of the Multiverse or something like that for it uh they they already have that baked in right there's nobody who's kind of like way out on the left side of that uh that spectrum anymore so i mean i i know that you know the the, the author is dead and all but my thoughts as I was making Knights Black Agents was that I was very deliberately trying to infuse as many of the great story game mechanics and design philosophies that I'd run into in the last uh, 20 years or 12 years uh, to that game as I could. Because right. it was a game that had an ending like a, like a story game. It was a game that uh, used great chunks of technology from other story games, uh, Primary among them, uh, Elizabeth's uh, amazing blowback, a uh, uh, pyramid uh, sure, right. pressure engine. Mm -hmm. But other things from other games, it's I, I put it all in the designer's notes so that uh, no one could accuse me of of stealing without leaving my mark, uh, my my, my mm -hmm. calling card. Um, but I think of uh, Nice Black Agents as just I guess what Darren said, a new trad game, a, a game that if you're any kind of uh, designer that wants to. Uh, move with the field, uh, become, uh, do things that take advantage of, of the new technology, that that's just your job as a designer. And I have no objection if people want to call Knights Black Agents Trad. I have no objection if they want to call it a story game with trad elements or whatever else. Um, as long as they bought it, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> uh, delighted. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. In, in my, in my mind, I'm a trad designer who, who, uh, occasionally does story games not a, right. a story game designer but likewise again we we've, we've talked about how useless your own self image is in these uh, environments so <laughs> you know however jim can sell my game i'm happy for him to do it the trad of jason is great go with god nick you got something for this or? i got nothing for this one fair enough all right andy Coffee shoot us guys. something shoot us something nothing or shut else. us down one or the other nope nothing else we're done I think that was a pile of fun. I think we had a lot of uh, we had a excellent discussion. We probably resolved absolutely nothing. Um, but honestly, if you were genuinely expecting us to do so, ha ha on you. Because yeah, yeah. uh, we, we certainly didn't. And we kept it to the one F bomb. So that's so PG. Right, exactly. That's yeah, nicely right. done. That's, I did not <laughs> well see done, that part coming. I really expected more F bombs for <laughs> I guess I that could was, take my shirt surprise. off if we wanted a hard R all of a sudden, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> that would be more of a soft R, I think. Right? Well, ex exceedingly all right, well, soft Thank now. you all very much. Can, I, can everybody take uh, a couple of minutes uh, like, just like to Joey kind R. of like remind everybody who you are and where they can find you uh, if they want to continue this discussion or, you know, like perhaps dip into your individual projects uh, and uh, shoot you some cash or that sort of thing. Uh, if if Rick can kind of take a minute or two to do that. Jim, you want to go ahead first? Sure, I'll start. Uh, so I am Jim Crocker. I um, was a retailer for many years. I'm not currently a retailer. I've kind of I've gotten out of that business because there's no more conventions for me to sell games at. But um, right. uh, probably a safe bet that whenever face-to-face -face uh, conventions do come back, I'll almost certainly be helping out my friends at Indie Press Revolution. So if you want to stop by and say hello to me, I am one of the co um originators creators i guess whatever you want to call it for indie games on demand at origins mm -hmm. one of the original cadre of people me and evan torner and uh, kira magran uh you know it was just the three of us with four tables you know way back in the day the first year we did it um and it has grown to be you know kind of a linchpin of uh role playing at origins that you know some people go there and just do it the whole time so you know, whenever Origins gets going again, I'll certainly uh, have a presence there. These days, I am most active on the Gauntlet online gaming community, 
which is gauntlet-rpg.com, where we play a whole lot of uh, indie, trad adjacent, and story games um, uh, at the uh, um, uh, online. Uh, we have a regular calendar. There's a Patreon that supports it that you can join, but you don't have to. We publish a monthly gaming scene called Codex, and I've done a little bit of game writing, adventure design, and I'm I'm solidly in that camp that Ken talked about of people who are deeply grateful that other people have done the math for me so that I can just, you know, put my batshit crazy ideas, you know, in some kind of format that has already been laid out. So uh, I've got a couple of pieces in the most recent um, uh, issue of Codex, the zine. I've got something called um, Top of the World, which is an adventure for Trophy Gold that has adventurers uh, fleeing across the rooftops of a fantasy city being chased by guards and all this kind of stuff, trying to get from the palace to the wall where they can get out of the city, but it all takes place entirely on the rooftops of this city. I wrote a a, um, a mystery for Brindlewood Bay, which is a, a story game of elderly ladies solving mysteries a la Murder super She cool. Is super with, cool. Yes. With a little bit of a kind of a, you know, a Shadow over Innsmouth kind of an um, angle to it. It turns out there's a, you know, supernatural stuff going on, and that is called Decorative Gore Season. Uh, in the you know fine New England tradition, so I'm starting to do a little bit of game writing. You can find it there. I'm on Twitter at Jim Likes Games, just like it sounds. And you know, like I'll be at conventions again once those start going up again. But you can find me online all over the place. And, and I've got a YouTube channel where I have a whole bunch of actual plays of a lot of different games. So awesome, Nick. Is it Jim Likes Games the YouTube channel? Uh, yes, it should be. I think. I'll, I'll go check on that. I'll go check back. I, I don't know. Like, it I think the... it's a thing where, like, when I... Darren will put it in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah, there we Come go. Well. That, yeah. That, that's perfect. There you go. Nick? Uh, general manager for Green Run and Publishing. So mm-hmm. most of the stuff is where I'm doing project management and ops stuff. And you won't see my name uh, except in the... In the company staff listing, but um, <laughs> I am really nosy, and so I hang around in the dev uh, Slack and give my two cents every now and then. Um, awesome. You can find me on Facebook as Nicole Andrews, on Twitter as Nick Chick, N I K C H I C K, and uh, and I spout off about a lot of stuff. So you know, you may or may not enjoy following that, but you can find me <laughs> if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Go Ken. <laughs> no, I'm just in, I'm just enjoying the, uh, the 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 quantum enjoyment question. I, I like that. Um, I'm Kenneth Height. I'm uh, at Kenneth Height on Twitter and Kenneth Height on Facebook. Uh, follow my every social media utterance for details. Obviously, every Friday, uh, myself and beloved uh, story game pioneer Robin D. Laws drop uh, Ken and Robin talk about stuff. Our multiple award winning podcast. Ken and Robin.stuff.com or wherever your fine podcasts are sold. Uh, go hunt us down and uh, like and subscribe and whatever else people say. Uh, my most recent uh, game is Fall of Delta Green. Uh, most of my most recent stuff is available from Pelgrain Press. Uh, but also, uh, I get my story game Yaya's out in the pages of Phoenix Magazine, uh, which is now available. Many of the issues are available, or at least the English parts of those issues are available in English on uh, the uh, drive through RPGs. So hunt up Ask Fagel, ask for them by name, and look for Phoenix in English, and you'll see, uh, occasionally, you'll see me, and that's good stuff. So uh, yeah, as far as everything else, um, I'm working on a 5e uh, setting called Hellenistica, which is uh, set in the good parts version of the third century BC, and an <laughs> expansion for Robin's Yellow King role-playing game. That's what I'm doing right now. But uh, feel free to uh, uh, follow me about, and I will never, ever, ever guide you wrong. Unlike Nicole, who <laughs> does not offer any such guarantee. Right? Definitely not. A very <laughs> scary version. Uh, I'm Darren Watts. Uh, if you want to talk to me about uh, convention-related stuff, you can reach me at Darren at Exposure. Uh, or you can find me on Facebook, Darren Watts, or uh, Twitter at Darren Watts 27 um especially if you're interested in hiring me as a writer or an editor uh if you are wanting to hear me have more opinions about uh, the uh, comic books instead of games you can follow my podcast which comes out every other wednesday uh at explain this.podbean.com uh and uh my current uh, writing projects are mostly for greater than games the sentinels of the comics uh sentinels of the multiverse comics rpg so 
And I want to say one other thing, which is that all of the three people here are people who I've known for many, many years. And all of you like have helped me immensely as a retailer. Um, it is not always easy to get the attention of and you know get good feedback from um, uh, you know like like folks that are designers and working in companies and stuff like that. Um, uh, and and I like to think that I'm here because all of you uh, you know were immensely helpful to me in all of those years as I as I was doing this because uh, you know with without folks like you, I wouldn't be able to, you know, to like to have made it as far as I did as a retailer. And so I just like, I want to make sure everybody watching this understands that, that, you know, I am here, uh, like I'm not a game designer. I'm, I don't run a gaming company. I've, I, all I've done is uh, benefited from the genius and hard work of other people. Um, uh, uh, hopefully it's, you know, it's helpful that I'm putting, you know, putting it in the hands of people that they might not otherwise be able to but i just i i do want to make sure everyone understands that uh that the three people that i'm here with have been hugely helpful to me through all the years that i've been doing this so thank you ah, thank you very kindly dear absolutely i think we're good thank you all very much for coming enjoy the rest of the show hi everybody thanks for having me on. bye thanks for having us on